gospel. And we've been outlining the way he presents, he makes his presentation. And, and we saw that the first 18 verses were kind of like a prologue, verses 1 through 18. And it took us a few weeks to get through those. But then from this point forward, from uh, 1, 19, all the way to the sixth chapter, the end of the sixth chapter, he's going to have us uh, consider, a period of consideration, to consider Jesus and who he is. And in the first part of the consideration, beginning in the 19th uh, verse in this first chapter, he's going to have us look at Jesus Christ and his disciples. That'll be the first thing to consider, is Christ and his disciples. So, so the part one that he's going to put in here is Christ and his disciples. Now we've been looking at this and seeing how the Lord Jesus has come forth. We saw that the first thing uh, in the first, by the way, there are paragraph markings in your, in your Bible if you look carefully. So this will begin at a paragraph marking at verse 19. And this is the record of John. And there's going to be four paragraphs that will follow. And each paragraph will line up with a particular day. And so we saw in the first paragraph marking at verse 19... There's an announcement made. The announcement is that one is coming greater than the person doing the announcing. The announcer is the voice, and the one coming is the Word. And the Word is greater than the voice. And, and the voice is John the Baptist, and the Word is Jesus Christ. So an announcement is made at that paragraph marking. At the next paragraph marking, which is in verse 29, there is the arrival. The announcement is made that he's coming, and in verse 29, he arrives. And the Lord Jesus Christ arrives on the scene and is introduced as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Of course, then the next paragraph marking that comes along is at verse 35. And in verse 35, we see the attraction, because two of the disciples that had been with John the Baptist and had been working with him, and listening to him as he preached in the wilderness and, and observing the things that he said and, and getting the baptism of repentance. Now all of a sudden when Jesus arrives, they leave John the Baptist and they're attracted to Jesus Christ. That's the way it ought to be. I mean, I mean, when you hear about Jesus Christ, someone tell you about Jesus Christ, and at first you may listen to that person talking to you and spend some time with that person talking to you about Jesus and, and asking them questions, but finally, when, when God gets a hold of your heart and Jesus passes by and you invite him into your heart, at that point your attraction ought to be to Jesus above anyone else even above the person that led you to him, even above the pastor that's preaching in the pulpit, or, or the evangelist that comes to town, or the missionary that's... I mean, the attraction should be to Jesus Christ. That, that ought to be what captures our heart, and that thrills our heart, and we ought to be following Jesus. And so we see the announcement, the arrival, and the attraction. And then the last paragraph marking you're going to hit is in, in verse 43, and now you're going to see is the assembly. Because Jesus is going to begin to assemble... I think it's verse 43, is it? I believe, yeah. 43. Yeah. And now we'll see the assembly, because Jesus is now going to assemble his disciples and put together a group of people that have a heart for God and want to do the work of God down here. And so we see the assembly in, in verse 43. So let's take a look at this as this happens. Verse 43, and the day following, another day, each one of those paragraphs markings is a day, so this would be the fourth day that John's recording here, day number four. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and he findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, that's the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, Hey, we found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Now, this Nathaniel, you learn later on in this very gospel, I think it's in chapter 21 and verse 2, where this Nathaniel was from. Yeah, here is John 21, verse 2. It says, Now there were together Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana. Nathaniel of Cana. Now, Cana was a small town in Galilee, and Galilee was the northernmost region of Israel. Israel was divided into three parts. It was divided into the southernmost region of Judah, or Judea, and that's where Jerusalem was. There was a middle region of Samaria, and there was a northernmost region of Galilee. And the way it kind of worked out was the, the Jews that were 
very careful about their heritage and their lineage and they didn't intermarry with the other people. They mostly lived in the region of Judea. They were Jews of Jews. They were Israelites of Israelites that Paul, Paul the Apostle spoke of. You know, and and they, they kept their, their heritage real clean and they were Judeans, they were Jews, if you will. That's where Israelites get the term Jews from, from that tribe of Judah that stayed so close to the temple. The Samaritans, a little bit higher up, they were a lot of crossbreeds that were half Jewish and half Gentile. And Galilee, way up north, well, it was known as Galilee of the Gentiles because that's where the Romans came in in the northern track as they made their way down to Israel, and they mostly settled up in that region. Now, there still were Jews up there, obviously, because Nathaniel's one of them, because Nathaniel gets this call. Now, he grows up in this small town of Cana, and a couple of villages over, there's this small town village of Nazareth. That's where Jesus grows up. Now, predominantly, all he knows about this region is it's mostly an area of Gentiles and heathen and pagan worshipers and idolaters. That's all he knows. So when somebody tells him that the one of Moses wrote of, when Philip says the one that Moses and the law and the prophets did write of, he's, Jesus, the thing he's expecting, Jesus of Jerusalem, Jesus of Judea, and all of a sudden, Jesus of Nazareth. This doesn't seem to make any sense to me. I mean, and, and so he, he asks, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And most I know about Nazareth, there's a lot of centurions that love up there, and there's a lot of Romans up there. I guess there's a small synagogue up there, but can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, Philip answers this honest question the best way he can. Come and see. You see, when we go out there and we deal with people about Jesus and about the Bible, people ask us questions. And, and lots of times, what happens over time and time, if you do this a lot, <laughs> you start to find that a lot of questions that you get, they're not sincere and they're not honest questions. This happens over and over when I'm out there witnessing, speaking about Jesus, telling people about the scriptures. I get a lot of disputing type of questions, the disputers of this world. And they're questioning, but they're really not questioning. They're just trying to put you off. They're, what they're trying to do is stump you. If they can just find one question you can't answer, then fine, then walk away. You don't know the answer. Nobody knows the answer. I'm an agnostic. And so what happens is often when people do question us, because we've had so many disputers question us, we figure everybody is questioning with a bad heart. But you know what? There are people that have honest questions, that have sincere questions, that they have questions that if you answer them, they're so pleased to find the answer, they really want to know. Nathaniel was like this. See, he really wanted to know the answer to this question. How can I tell? Because Philip invites him. He says, come and see. I mean, you think about this. You're out there and you're telling one of your friends about Jesus Christ at the workplace. Or you're telling a neighbor, you know, one day you're out there in the back doing some spring cleaning and your neighbor's there. And you start telling about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And then he starts asking some questions. Well, you, you can say, you know what, why don't you come to church and see? Why don't you come and see? Why? Well, I'll tell you why I invite someone to church. Why church is a good place to invite someone. I mean, Jesus today... Spiritually, he's in, physically, he's in heaven. But he said he would build his church. He told Peter, he said, I will build my church. So you want to know where Jesus is doing his greatest work? In the church house. Because that's where he's, in, he's laboring and building as he's bringing forth new births and he's edifying and building up and strengthening Christians. And that's where he's doing his work. And so you say to someone, come and see. Now, if your neighbor says, well, then I'll be there with you. I'll come on Sunday. What time is service? Oh, it's, it's 11 o'clock? Sure, I'd love to come. Then you know you've got someone who's like Nathaniel. Someone who, he doesn't have any guile. This is an honest question that he's asking. And if you've got someone that puts you off with a million excuses, well, then, then you don't have someone like Nathaniel. Nathaniel had an honest question, and the best answer is, well, why don't you come and see? Just invite him. Just invite him. The answers are, here at the church house where the Lord Jesus Christ is building his church, using his word, taking the word of God with the spirit of God and ministering the truth of God to people's hearts and minds and souls. So, you know, Philip says to him, come and see. And notice, Nathanael gets up and he starts to go in that direction. Verse 47, then Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. Notice, he was coming. He was taking the first step. You see, you draw nigh unto God and God will draw nigh unto you. And Jesus saith of him, Hey, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. You had honest questions, and you really were seeking. And here you are coming for answers. I'm going to give you answers. But Nathaniel 
is still wondering, well, who is this man of Nazareth? In verse 48, Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus <laughs> answered and said, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. And why is that? You see, Jesus showed him that he knew about his life. Now, the, the, the reference to the fig tree, under the fig tree, when Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I'm assuming, if I take that literally, the way it is right there, that, that maybe Nathaniel was a, a meditative kind of guy. And he went out one day, and he was, speaks of this in the book of Isaiah, that there's a day coming when Jesus is ruling in the millennium, when people will be under the vine and fig tree when they're going to be able to really have the rest that God would have us to have. And maybe he was out there, and he, he chose a fig tree, it was nice and shady, and he's sitting and he's meditating, and he's thinking about life in general. And he figures, and I'm also hiding from people that are bothering me, there's no phone calls, no beepers, no cell phones out here, and he's just meditating. He's being still. That's one of the greatest ways to let God speak to you, to be still and know that I am the Lord. And one of the problems we have in modern society is we are so busy that God's still, small voice can't reach through the hearts and souls today because there's constant activity going on, whether it's the television, whether it's the telephone, whether it's just uh, uh, friends communing one more than another, or whether it's now these little Walkmans that they wear. And there's music going on all the time, and it's preventing God's still, small voice from getting to someone. But Nathaniel, he was one, he was out there. He was thinking. He's under the fig tree. He thought he was hiding from people, maybe, just to get alone with God. Maybe he was praying. Now, Philip found him, but Jesus knew where he was before Philip found him. Jesus knew what this man was about. You know, when you and I come to Jesus, when I came to Jesus, I was amazed at how much he knew about me. I mean, I felt just like Nathaniel. I mean, he knew my places of, of refuge where I would go to hide out. He knew the kind of things that were going through my heart. I mean, I was amazed as Jesus revealed himself to me. I could only confess he's the Son of God. There's no doubt. He knew my innermost thoughts. Now, let me tell you a story that happened to me one night. I was uh, called in to do surgery one night at about, I don't know, one in the morning or something like that. And, uh, and, there, and, and right after that, there was another case to be done. And it was the same surgeon. So, so we're waiting for them to change the rooms over, and we go into the doctor's uh, lounge, and we're the only two guys there because it's like 2.30 in the morning. And we're just sitting there, and I thought this is a great opportunity for me to talk about spiritual things with this man. So we started talking, and I got him into spiritual things, and, and he was curious. He started asking me questions, and, uh, and I think they were sincere questions. So I started telling him what I knew about people from the Bible what I had learned about mankind from the Bible, what I'd learned about myself from the Bible. And I started telling him things like, you know, I realized that, that as I was going through life, I was looking for all kinds of things. And it says, he that seeketh silver and gold shall not be satisfied with silver and gold. And I told him, I found that, you know, I'm a doctor like you are, and I thought if I finally got to the position of, of having my MD and getting a good job and getting a good house and, and a good income, that I would be happy. But I found there was an emptiness in my soul. I was just relating the things that the Lord had showed me about myself, and he said, stop, stop, you're telling me my whole life. And he, see, what happened was Jesus knew about this man's life, and Jesus was speaking to him through me and revealing himself to this person. And that's what will happen. You see, the Bible knows our hearts. The Bible knows our thoughts. The Bible knows our emotions. And as we study this book and we begin to minister this word to other people, it gives the Lord an opportunity to present himself. And for them to realize, wow, you know, I'm an open book to God. I'm an open book to God. Mm -hmm. Then it's up to them to take the step and confess that Jesus is the Son of God and the King of Israel. The gentleman I was dealing with that day was a Jewish gentleman, and he was really wrestling with that concept. And it was very difficult for him to, to do like Nathaniel and say, Thou art the Son of God, the King of Israel. I guess he had a little bit of guile left in him, see. And Nathaniel was stripped of his guile, and that's what it takes for us to make the confession. But Jesus says to him, he says, Before you were called, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now also in the scriptures we'll find that the fig tree goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. There's a lot of, there's a lot of parallels between John's gospel and the book of Genesis. 
Go back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, after the fall occurs, and they both eat, in the end of verse 6, uh, and, and she gave also unto her husband with her, and, and he did eat. And verse 7, and the eyes of both of them were opened, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, and, and they, they, they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Aprons, that's interesting. You, you rearrange that word to come up with parson, but I don't, I don't know. What the, but um, <laughs> <laughs> anyways, but anyways they, they took fig leaves to make aprons to cover their nakedness. Now, God did not accept their fig leaves. Later on in this chapter, when the Lord is with them, he's going to slay a lamb and cover them with clothing of, clothing of skin from the lamb. Because the fig leaf, is a picture of man attempting to cover his own sin. It's man doing the best he can to cover himself up. And you know where we all were? We were all under the fig tree. We're all trying to hide behind our own good works. We're all trying to justify the things that we do in this life. To think, you know, and there was a poll taken asking people if you think you're going to heaven, and 91% of the respondents thought they were going to heaven which was curious because only 59% of the respondents thought there was a heaven, which I thought was interesting. It just shows the confusion that goes on because that was in the USA Today poll. 59% of people believe there's a heaven, 91% believe they're going. And um, that's the confusion that reigns down here in darkness. But nonetheless, the reason so many believe they're going is because when they look at themselves in the mirror, they've covered themselves with fig leaves and they no longer see their nakedness. But, but, but the Lord Jesus Christ, he knows our need. And, and Nathaniel was at the point, notice, where he was ready to leave the fig tree and come to Jesus. Go back to John 1. That's exactly what he did. He left the fig tree and he came to Jesus. See, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him. The only way that we can get those good works that we think we have behind us and lay those down is when we come to Jesus and Jesus can reveal our need and then his provision for our need. So Nathanael answers and says, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Now, this is going to be the sixth name that's given to the Lord Jesus Christ is the King of Israel. In this first chapter, John's going to run a lot of sevens and we'll review them in a minute. The sixth thing that's revealed here is that he is the king of Israel. Now this is a title that's found back in the Old Testament in, in two places. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23 and we'll look at the fifth verse when we get there. And then after Jeremiah we'll look at Daniel. But in Jeremiah 23 and in verse 5, this, this is a rough chapter. <laughs> This is a chapter that I think people in the pulpit need to read. Okay, if you're in a pulpit and you're preaching the Word of God, or you say you're preaching the Word of God, and you claim you're ministering on God's behalf, you need to read this chapter. Because in this chapter, God wants to speak to you to make sure that you are speaking for Him and not for yourself. And, and this is a rough chapter. He says, Woe, verse 1, Woe to the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. And, and the Lord is not pleased with pastors that preach anything other than the Son of God, the King of Israel, Jesus Christ, because he should take the preeminence in all messages. Jesus Christ is what this is all about. Christianity is not about the church. Christianity is not about us. Christianity is about Christ. It's about Jesus Christ. Christianity isn't a lifestyle. Christianity is Christ. And it's about taking Christ as your Savior and letting Christ live through you. And so, it's very important, and notice what he says, uh, the Lord was so upset with the pastors that were scattering the, shot, uh, the, the flock, that he said, uh, uh, verse 4 and 5, I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king. The king shall reign and prosper, shall execute judgment and justice 
in the earth. The Lord's going to raise a king. This is to David. David was the king of Israel. This king that's going to come from the loins of David is going to be the everlasting king that's going to reign in righteousness and judgment. Later on in the book of Daniel, after Jeremiah, go a few books to the right and turn to Daniel chapter 7 and look at verse 14. Daniel 7, 14. In the, in the vision that Daniel is given upon his bed, when the interpretation is given to him, he says this, verse 14, And there was given him, this is the one on the throne, dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So Daniel's given a vision of this king and his kingdom that's coming. Now keep your finger in Daniel and turn back to John. But stay with Daniel 7 because we're going to go back there in a minute. And turn back to John 1 where, where Nathaniel is making this confession about the king of Israel. He, he, he apprehended this because Nathaniel was, was a, a Jewish boy that had grown up in a small synagogue and he had heard the teachings of Jeremiah and he had heard the teachings of Daniel and in Israel was waiting for its king to come. And he recognized that Jesus of Nazareth is that king. He's the Son of God, the King of Israel. Now Jesus, notice what Jesus does. To him that hath shall more be given. Jesus does this. If, if you begin to apprehend the truths that he reveals to you, he gives you more truth. This is one of the great teachings that Jesus does. This is one of the blessed things in Matthew 13 when they, asked, they said to the Lord, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He said, I'll tell you why I speak to the parables. Because unto you it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, and unto them it's not given. And to him who hath, more shall be given. Because what Jesus realizes, once your knowledge base is growing, you're ready for more. So here in Nathaniel, he's apprehended the first truths. Jesus is going to give him more truth in verses 50 and 51. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou. But thou shalt see greater things than these. You know, when you and I come to Jesus, when we leave the fig tree and we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we get a hold of the fact that, that He's the Savior, that He's the Redeemer, that He is the King, that He's the Son of God, then, then that blesses Jesus. And then He wants to turn and return a blessing to us. You know, we're always looking that if I give Jesus, you know, some money, and, and then he'll give more back to me. You're always thinking in terms of, of, of uh, monetary and physical things. Well, what about when we give him uh, apprehension and of the truths and we get a hold of those things? Then he pours out even more blessing upon us. See, as we believe what he said and we believe what God said about him, then God gives us even more wisdom and light and knowledge and understanding. These are the great things God wants to bless us with, like Solomon, so that we'll be wiser than the people here on earth. Like the psalmist said, I, I, I know more than my teachers because thy precepts are my counselors. As we start to come to the Word of God, Jesus reveals more. He says, now I'm going to show you more, verse 51. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open. Isn't that a blessing? I mean, heaven open. Until I met Jesus Christ, heaven, well, I wasn't even sure it existed. I was like the people in the poll. And if it did exist, I might have hoped against hope that maybe I'd be okay to go in, but there's no possible way I could have known that heaven was open to me personally. But you know what, Jesus Christ? Here's the promise. Heaven is open to those that know Jesus. It's not I hope I'm saved. I know I'm saved. It's not I think I might go after I spend some time in purgatory. Heaven is open to those that have made the confession to Jesus Christ. And we're going to see heaven open. Folks, the day's coming when you and I are going to be ushered into the presence of God by the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see heaven open. What a deal. 
I mean, there's places down here that, that people look forward to going to. Some people look forward to a nice uh, cottage retreat. Some people look forward to a nice uh, cabin that they want to go to. Some people look forward to Disney World they want to go to. Some people look forward to Las Vegas. I don't know why, but they want to go to. But they have different places. And the thought that the place is open to them, the thought that they can go in through an open door is very exciting. Now, down here on Earth, you've got to pay big bucks for any one of those things. But you know what? Heaven is better than any of those things I mentioned. Better than all those things put together. And heaven is open because of Jesus Christ. And he says, verily, verily. When Jesus says, verily, verily, to you and to me, you can bank on it. That's truly, truly. He's witnessing to each eye, to each ear, to make sure you get it. Verily, verily, I say to you, hereafter, ye shall see heaven open. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now he reveals the seventh title in this chapter. It's the Son of Man. And it's the only one that he refers, you know, when he refers to himself as. He refers to himself as the Son of Man. Now where'd that term come from? Well, you've got your finger in Daniel? It comes from Daniel. It's the only time it's mentioned in the Old Testament in this particular manner. Look at the 13th verse. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Capital S, the Son of Man. That's the only time it's mentioned like that in the Old Testament with a capital S. And interestingly, also in the Old Testament, only one time is the Son of God mentioned with a capital S in the Old Testament. It's also in Daniel's book. Go back to the second chapter, or the third chapter, chapter 3 and verse 25. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. This is when they were put in the fire by, by Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace. And, and the king looks and he says, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And so in Daniel's book, you see both the Son of God and the Son of Man. Now, we've already seen the Son of God in, in chapter 1, because that's been confessed by a number of people, Jesus is the Son of God. And the Son of God comes before the Son of Man in both passages. Why? Because first and foremost, we needed the Son of God. Because if Jesus were just a man, he couldn't have saved us. Because the Son of Man alone couldn't save us. But the Son of God alone couldn't save us. He also needed to be a man. He had to be like us so that he could pay for our sins. So he was both God and man. But notice the humility of Jesus Christ, the title he takes for himself when he's down here. I mean, I don't know about you or me, but maybe if I were walking around, I'd let everybody know I'm the Son of God. But notice how he wants to relate to the brethren, how he wants to be like unto us. And this is the favorite term that he uses for himself, the Son of Man, as you read through the Gospels. Because he's like unto his brethren. He's not ashamed to be like one of us and to identify with us. Are we ashamed to identify with him? I mean, when you think that, that God's Son would leave the ivory palaces of glory and come down and be like one of us, and, and folks think about it. He had to eat, he had to drink, he had to go to the bathroom. I mean, all the things he had to do that he never did up there in heaven. And he had to do this stuff down here. And he's not ashamed to identify with us. And sometimes, you know, we get ashamed to identify with him. Well, we ought to be encouraged. We ought to be encouraged by Jesus and by his Holy Spirit to be so pleased that God would take us like he did Nathaniel and tell us, hey, you're going to see heaven open and the Son of Man's going to usher you right in. And, and, and that's the, the seventh title that he gives. Now, he talked about, going back to John 1, he talked about a ladder in this chapter. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So they're going up and down on something. Now this is going to relate all the way back to the vision that Jacob had back in Genesis chapter 28. Because the same thing was happening in Genesis 28. Jesus is now putting together two passages of Scripture, and he knows that Nathaniel is a man that has an understanding of Scripture. And this is the way Jesus reveals truth to you and me. When he starts to see that we have an apprehension of things in Scripture, he starts to put them together 
like an erector set, like a tinker toy set, line upon line, precept upon precept, to give us a greater understanding of the scriptures. Now go back to where we were in Genesis 28 and pick it up in verse 10. Here's where Jacob had to leave his, his home because of the turmoil. Verse 10, and, and Jacob went out from Beersheba, and he went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And, and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. So he's above the ladder. And he said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. And the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee, and in thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, of course, Jacob has his name changed to Israel. So it's going to be an Israelite indeed. Through his seed will all the earth be blessed. It's going to have to be a physical seed of Jacob to get the blessing. Jesus said, I'm the son of man. The son of man. I'm that ladder. I'm born of the seed. I am an Israelite, the king of Israel. See, notice what happened in verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and he said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. You see, that ladder is the only way that you and I can go through the open door of heaven, the open gate of heaven. And Jesus Christ just said, It's the Son of Man. It's the Son of Man that's going to be the ladder that's going to connect heaven and earth. It's the Son of Man that is going to reveal God to men. And it's the Son of Man that's going to bring men to God. And the, and the ladder goes up and down based on the revelation of the Son of Man and then men coming up that ladder to heaven. And, and heaven is open right there at Jacob's ladder. And Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that ladder. Now, remember at Babel they tried to build their own way to heaven? They tried to make a tower that reaches to heaven? Today we have astronauts trying to shoot themselves off into heaven. I read an article about um, one of the Russian cosmonauts that was up there. Now the Russians, as you know, their religion is atheism. And so they're raised with an atheistic outlook. And one of the Russian cosmonauts, I can't remember, it was Yuri, I can't remember his last name. He was up there and he was floating around and he came back and he reported to his nation to let them know, I can tell you assuredly I was up there in the heaven and I didn't see God. He doesn't exist. Well, he, he didn't go far enough and, 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 and furthermore, a spaceship whether it be the Starship Enterprise or whatever it is, isn't, gonna get, isn't the open door to heaven. You're not going to get through that way. The only way you're going to find the open door to heaven is by the Son of Man, which is by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way. Uh, Jesus, that latter, is the incarnate deity, partaker of the celestial bliss and human misery. Yeah, he's the Son of God and the Son of Man. Lo, up and down the scale the angels move with love, and God the great invisible himself appears above. The only way that you're going to see God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way. He's Jacob's ladder. Now, let's review some of the things we've seen in this first chapter as we wind it up here. There's a lot of sevens running through this particular chapter. There were seven paragraphs that ran through this chapter. There were seven names that were given to the Lord Jesus Christ in this chapter. Let me get these things on the board for you so you can take them down or they'd be a blessing to you. The seven names that were given, he was called the Word, the incarnate Word, the creating Word, the eternal Word. He's the light, the only one that can bring spiritual light to those of us who are in darkness. And by nature, we're in darkness. We don't have an understanding of spiritual things. Philosophers go on and on and on to the point where they have to reach the, reach the state of existentialism. They don't even know if they exist. One of them said, I think, therefore I am. 
And I think maybe his statement is incomplete. It probably should be, I think, therefore I am confused. <laughs> it's probably what it should have been. And, and there's a lot of confusion in those things. Uh, he's, he's known as the Son of God. The only begotten Son of God. We saw him as the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, whom God hath chosen to reveal truth and to reconcile men. We saw him as the Lamb of God that taketh away not just the sins of Israel, but the sins of the world. And that's what's needed. Why? Because he's not just the God of the Jews. He's the God of the Gentiles also. He's the God of all the earth. We saw him as the King of Israel. As Nathaniel said, Thou art the King of Israel. And that he is. And there's a day coming when he'll be back and ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. And Israel shall be the head of nations. And, as he calls himself, he's the Son of Man, because he's both God and man. Those are the seven names that we saw in this particular chapter. We also saw seven works that were related to the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw that he created the world. In the first few verses, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Amazing. Just an amazing thing. I, I get, I, I'm always amazed by anyone that can build anything. You saw how much trouble I had putting a 9-volt battery in, in the back there. And so I just, he created the world. We saw that, that he gives salvation. Because it said, to as many as received him, to them gave he gave power to become the sons of God. And without Jesus Christ and without receiving Him, there's no way you and I can be a son of God. God is a spirit. We must be spiritually adopted into His kingdom. Flesh and blood, our first birth does not give us the right to enter into God's kingdom. The salvation comes through Jesus Christ. We saw also that He reveals God. Because it says, No man hath seen the Father. But the only begotten, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. People say, show me the Father. Philip will say that later on in this very book. And Jesus says, he that seen me hath seen the Father. Because he reveals God. We learn about God's heart. We learn about God's love. We learn about God's holiness. We learn about God's judgment. He reveals God to us in fullness. Another thing we saw that he does, something that John the Baptist couldn't do and that none of us can do, is he baptizes with the Spirit. There's a lot of confusion down here today where people think that water baptism can make someone a son of God. Water baptism maybe is involved in giving someone salvation, but God is a Spirit and it must be a baptism of the Spirit and only Jesus Christ could do that. John the Baptist confessed, he denied not, he says, I baptize you with water, but there's one coming after me. He it is that baptizes with the Holy Ghost. He's the only one that can give the spiritual baptism. When does he give it? When you come to him in faith. It's by faith. That the spirit faith that the spiritual baptism is given. We also saw as the Lamb of God, He removes sin. He just doesn't cover sin up for a while, and then all of a sudden it rears its ugly head again, and then we got a problem with sin and wonder if we're right with God, and maybe we've lost our salvation, or we're out of fellowship with God. No, Jesus Christ removes sin. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth from all sin. It's removed as far as the east is from the west. It's forgotten in God's sight. It's forgotten. It is removed. That's what they never could do in the Old Testament. All they could do was cover it once a year at the Day of Atonement. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came, He taketh away the sin of the world. He's removed it once and for all. And the next thing that we see Him do, and, and we saw this with Nathaniel, He has an intimate knowledge of all of us. He has an intimate knowledge of man. Our thoughts, lo, there is not a word on my tongue, but thou knowest it already, the psalmist said. The Lord knows the very thoughts that we have. He knows the very words that we speak. He knows the very places that we go. He knows us intimately, and he loves us. He loves us. He, re he remembers, the psalmist says, that we are but dust. 
He knows the frailties that we have. He knows that we're pulled down by gravity, not just physical gravity, but the spiritual gravity of sin. And he realizes that as sheep we go astray, and he realizes that we fall in the mire and in the muck and in the pit. But you know what? He's willing to pick us right back up and cleanse us. And the last work that we see him do is he opens heaven's door. He opens heaven. And no one else does. And no one else can. The church does not have the keys to heaven. The preacher doesn't have the keys to heaven. Good works are not the keys to heaven. Jesus Christ says in Revelation, I have the keys. And he has the keys of heaven. And he's the only one that can open heaven. And he's the door to heaven. And these are the seven works that we see in this chapter. And then also in this chapter, the way the sevens follow through with the seven paragraphs and the seven words and the seven works, are there are seven witnesses in this chapter that witness about the Lord Jesus Christ. The first one we saw was John Baptist. He confessed and he denied not. And this is a little tiny Baptist church and we want to be like John the Baptist. We want to confess Jesus Christ and we want to deny him not. And we want to say there's one coming that's greater than we are. Best we can do is wash you with a little water, but he can baptize you with the Holy Spirit. His name is Jesus Christ, John the Baptist. We saw John the Apostle. All through this chapter, and as he goes and, and he tells people and he follows Jesus, John the Apostle witnesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We were told the Old Testament prophets. This is written of in the prophets and Moses. And you can search the scriptures. And in any chapter you go in the Bible, you'll find Jesus Christ in there. In type. In shadow. As the Lord is, is pointing forward to the substance, the body is Christ. And the shadow casts itself over the Old Testament. And he's all through there in all the types. And we're studying Genesis and we're seeing him over and over again. And we go through Exodus in the tabernacle. You'll see all the pictures of Jesus Christ as the Old Testament prophets. We saw Daniel, the Son of Man, the Son of God, the Old Testament prophets. But there's one even greater than that. The Holy Spirit himself. The greatest ally that you and I have in the work that we do as we go out and tell people about Jesus Christ is God's Spirit bears witness to what we say. Don't, don't ever be discouraged or disheartened when you're out there and you're talking about Jesus and it seems like someone is blowing you off. Because while you're speaking about Jesus Christ, at the very moment you're speaking, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness to their heart and their soul and their conscience and their mind. The Holy Spirit will never leave you alone when you testify for Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself. He shall testify of me, Jesus said. He's always out there trying to glorify Jesus Christ. And when you and I just open our mouth, the Holy Spirit moves right in to work with people. I can tell you time and time again where I've witnessed for Jesus Christ and you could see as the Holy Spirit was working in their heart, and I'm sure you've seen it too, the Holy Spirit will witness with us. Of course, we saw Andrew, Andrew the bringer. He went right out, and the first thing he did, he found his brother Peter. And he witnessed for Jesus Christ. And, and I'm sure, and I know in my life, when I got saved, I thought of my family right away, and I'm sure you did too, just like Andrew. We saw Philip going out there, Philip finding his friend Nathaniel. Good to tell your friends about Jesus too. And the last witness we saw was Nathaniel himself. And all he was doing was just opening his mouth in confession and witness to God. I probably spelled that wrong. A great name. It means the gift of God. And we saw Nathaniel witnessing. So in this chapter, as we see it come together, what a great first chapter. I mean, what an opening chapter. This is enough. You read the first chapter, you... What are you going to do? I'll take Jesus as my Savior. And guess what? There's 20 more chapters for us to go through. 
And there's a lot of good stuff as we go through it because now that this first chapter, as, as John is bringing forth and saying, I want you to consider Jesus Christ, he's now going to go forth from here and he's going to present to you and to me and the readers of this book seven miracles, which will be starting next week in chapter 2 with the wedding feast at Cana. Seven miracles and an explanation of why these miracles are performed. So I, I love this book. I love the Gospel of John. You can, you can safely tell anyone to read the Gospel of John. This is the greatest book to start in the Bible. There's so much meat in this, and yet, and yet it's presented in such a simple form that the smallest child can get it. Amen, and I think she got it. She's convicted, <laughs> the Holy Spirit. Amen. Any questions on what we've been studying? Yes? The significance of sevens. Well, the thing I can get is turn back to Revelation, and I think it's chapter 5. Chapters 4 and 5 in Revelation. All through the pattern of Scripture, God uses seven to complete things. In the creation week, there were seven days and the week was finished and God rested on the seventh. And so seven is something that the Lord uses to, to speak of, of fulfillment and, 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 and uh, completion. So, for example, when in chapter 4, when uh, the Apostle John is up in heaven and he's looking about the throne, and what he sees is he sees one on the throne, and verse 5, and he says, Out of the throne proceed lightnings and, and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This is the fullness of God. The seven is a number of fullness and completion. So it's a pattern we're going to see running throughout the scriptures. And, and here we were seeing it in the first chapter. It's just something to observe. Seven rhymes with heaven. So, I mean, you get that fullness. You got, it's, it's, God makes it simple for us. The significance of seven. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the great uh, teachings that you bring forth in the scriptures to us. Uh, please continue to open our eyes that we may behold the wondrous things out of the scriptures, Lord. Uh, we, we're so thankful that Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, has come and redeemed us. Uh, like like uh, Nathaniel, we've left our fig tree. It's not our good works, Lord. We just come on our knees, uh, thankful, and, and ask for you to reveal more. We thank you that someday we'll see heaven open and we'll get to ascend on the Son of Man to be ushered into the presence of a holy God where we can say, worthy is the Lamb to receive all glory and honor and power and blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Watching Search the Scriptures with Dr. Michael Caesar, pastor of Grace and Truth Church. We hope you have enjoyed today's teaching. If you would like to learn more about Grace and Truth Church and the Search the Scriptures ministry, please visit us on the web at www.graceandtruthchurch.org or write to us at Grace and Truth Church, P.O. Box 433. Williamsville, New York, 14231.